Hopefully we won't. The broadcast yeah. is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Should, should I have not done that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so everybody on the phone now can hear us. So, um, Kathy, and uh, if you're on, if you want to just maybe give me a little notes, let me know if you can hear me. There's only, uh, I only see two of us so far. Kathy's oh, attendees. Kathy Reynolds is on. Kathy and Greg. Um, yeah, can you guys hear us right now? Yeah, can, you, uh, can you give me a question or a chat? Throw me a chat. Let me know if you're hearing, hearing me. Yeah, yeah, they're hearing us. Okay, so we got to keep our uh, comments measured. <clears throat> so I'd say your volume is just the tad I, low. I just stop What's that? Did I just stop the broadcast? No, 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 don't, don't do anything like that. Just leave it be. Um, but I'm gonna... All right, I wanna thank everybody for joining us for today's uh, Asterix webinar entitled, Why are Biotechs and Mid-Sized Pharmaceutical Organizations Choosing Scientific IT Managed Services? So that's what we're gonna dig into today, the, the, the notion of how managed services is, is, is really a big decision factor uh, for these biotechs and pharma companies. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. And before we get into today's session, just a real quick about Asterix, who we are, um, why we're talking to you today about these topics, etc. And then we'll get, uh, we'll introduce our presenter and, and get into it from there. So we are an informatics professional services and strategic outsourced solutions company uh, that is dedicated exclusively to helping the scientific community. A couple of quick stats about uh, Asterix. We were established uh, in 1995 and are privately held. Uh, the company itself originated in the IT division of a company called APBI Life Science, which was a life science research organization. Today we have seven offices in the United States and one in beautiful Costa Rica and our headquarters are in Red Bank, New Jersey. We work with Fortune 1000 life science enterprises, chemical and CPG government research institutions, typically with large and fast growing IT and outsource or compliance needs. Our mission has and always will be to deliver scalable, sustainable solutions for the scientific community. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, as far as solutions relative to lab informatics and, and some of the software uh, world that we deal with, <clears throat> um, we deal end to end in terms of the services we provide which span the complete life cycle of scientific data systems. That begins with business process analysis and enterprise architecture. Those two areas are very popular solutions that we bring, which is going in and helping laboratories, you know, and research institutions figure out what they need based on who they are, what they do, and how they go to market. From there, we can actually help to select different technologies and then even help implement them and configure them and, and train you on using them. Uh, when we get finished with that, we can help with computer systems validation. And then some of the things we're gonna be talking about today are gonna be things like um, laboratory system services or managed services or even staffing services uh, once you're up and running, uh, how we can help manage these systems for you either on site uh, or remotely. At the end of the day, we evaluate, implement, and manage systems to enhance the collection and processing of scientific data. We've got a very knowledgeable person uh, who's with us who's going to lead our presentation today. So let me take a moment to introduce the next slide, uh, Chris McClure, who's going to be uh, presenting to you. Chris is a managing director here at Asterix, uh, and as a managing director in the informatics professional services practice, he leads the Asterix Managed Services Program. He oversees all professional services delivery in the Northeast region, and he brings 25 years of great experience in life sciences. He's led informatics product development and professional services across many different leading pharmaceuticals and biotech companies. So Chris, I'm gonna go ahead and let you pick up from here and I'll pop back on at the end. Great, thanks, Kevin. And, uh, and, and thank you all for, for joining us on this uh, this Wednesday as we, we get through the week here. So the presentation that I have is, is going to attempt to accomplish three things as we go through it. We're going to talk about the value of managed services, you know, so just the overall value, and this is probably a story that you've heard before. Um, but then I want to dive into how it is more applicable for uh, the smaller farmers, the, the mid-sized companies, the biotechs, uh, as we start to get into their world and then their growing and, and as they're, they're building out their piece. I'm going to wrap up with just a couple of slides in terms of Asterix managed services offerings because uh, those are near and dear to my heart and, uh, and that is part of my responsibilities here at Asterix. 
Um, so with that being said, let's dive in. Uh, so a couple of table setting slides just to kick us off. So um, we, we're talking a lot now about managed services because it has been the evolution of staffing for pharma. Uh, so when I joined my first biotech uh, back in 94, everybody was a full-time employee. And we didn't have the concept of even consultants yet or CROs. Um, we, were, we were all there and it was a matter of each of us wearing as many hats as we could to try and keep the headcount number uh, as low as possible, but still drive the work and get it done. As we started to work in through the 90s, the early 2000s, we had the evolution of the pharmaceutical contractor. So now is a scenario where you were hiring people, bringing them in. They weren't part of your overall headcount, um, but they were there to help deliver work. We had some employment law change, which then capped the amount of time someone could be in a contractor position uh, when they were truly doing full-time work. And pharma had to evolve again. And, and that's really where we've gotten to now with, with the leveraging of the CROs, uh, as well as the adoption of the managed services. Okay. So when we talk about managed services, there's many different pieces. Okay. So you know, my, my favorite part is you know, when people say, well, we don't use managed services today. Well, you, know, you have your cafeteria workers. These people are essential to your overall operations. They're not doing research, they're not doing discovery, but they're feeding you lunch. Um, so in a lot of cases, you know, that's an outsourced opportunity. You've got somebody down there who is coming in and fulfilling the need for X number of meals per day. Um, building and site maintenance, you know, laboratory consumable management. This is one of the newer ones where the consumable companies will come in and stock your shelves every single night and they manage that process. Uh, we've seen scenarios where procurement is now being outsourced. So Thermo Fisher's coming in, they're offering people to be doing the procurement work such that uh, they can actually have a first-hand knowledge of what's going on. You know, it's a cheaper opportunity for the company um, and, and it's a good opportunity for, for the, uh, the Thermo Fisher vendor as well. The classic is IT. Okay, so we've been outsourcing IT forever and the, the picture down here at the bottom comes from our friends at Hitachi. Uh, but there it's a scenario where you were trying to make IT delivered offshore, near shore, try to get the cost down as much as possible. We're now taking an approach where those sort of classic managed services you know, are now starting to blend with what I like to call scientific managed services. So asset management, so you see the groups like Cross Labs, OneSource, uh, they come in and they're now starting to manage the maintenance of your systems. So PMs, calibrations, qualifications, those sort of things. Scientific application support. Now you're looking at outsourcing dishwashing, outsourcing media prep, even protein prep and, and compound screening at some points. Uh, so it's, it is a case where companies are now coming in and offering that turnkey responsibility for those. Two of my favorites, lab computing and project and program management. So the lab computing this is now taking the concept, the old concept of IT outsourcing, but looking at it and saying the lab is a special place. The PCs that are there really are different. So let's take a different approach to it. And then program and project management. We've worked in a way where we've put a great emphasis of putting standards in place. So now that you can actually outsource project management and you're getting the same style of management for each one of your projects as it comes through. So, so again, just taking the function and moving it out. So these are all becoming relatively common within our industry. When people say why, everybody's first response is cash. You know, it's cheaper, we're gonna save money. And, and that's really not the driving factor. Um, it is a piece of it. You see, I have it listed down here as third in terms of managing costs. Um, but the more important pieces are you get to focus on your strategic core business objectives. So what are you there for? If you're a pharmaceutical company, you're there to make a drug. You're there to make a therapy. You're there to have a discovery item. And you're really not there as a true area of competitive advantage when you start talking about making your medias better or prepping your proteins better. And so you're focusing really now, what is it on your true difference making within your research organization? 
Other benefits, access expertise when and where you need it. Um, so often you need the guy, but only for a partial amount of the time. So within a managed service, you might have multiple people working within that service, different levels of expertise, different levels of experience. You start to move into who it is that you need to. Uh, managed costs, it is. All right, so we do want to save money. We do want to have repeatable, stable monthly bills. It gives great visibility. It starts to become part of that strategic part of maximizing your value. Managed services gives you the option for scale. So especially with now your growing companies, you have different needs when you're five versus 20 people, different needs when you're 20 versus 100. And that scale also pivots with what is your time in terms of your needs. So if we're talking about a manufacturing group, you know, are you going from your traditional nine to five to now a 24 by seven model? Uh, is it a case where you now need overnight coverage to allow your, your full-time lab informatics people to have the night off? There is an element of shifting risk. Okay? And, and when we say shifting risk, we're always talking within our, our services as establishing partnerships. And so when we say shifting risk, it's not a true 100% shift of risk, but what it is is that you're now managing the delivery of something. You're asking for X number of units within a certain amount of time, and those are gonna be coming with certain levels of metrics. Those metrics all roll up to governance. The governance moves to a contractual document. It all becomes very enforceable. So we're able to minimize risk as, as we shift it from our full-time employees off to our, our outsourced managed service people. A proactive program, once someone is really good at what they're doing in terms of service, we expect continuous improvement from them still. We want them to now be looking ahead. How do you prevent the problem? You now the snowplow drivers, how do you catch the snowflake on the way down? And that would certainly avoid a lot of accidents if we could do that. So how do you be proactive within that? And, and then the big part, we're, it is a partnership. You know, so I mentioned that above, but we're, we're really looking to establish a partnership within this. So these, these real pros that I'm putting here, you know, they apply to big companies, to small companies, um, almost evenly. All right? But when we start to look at the smaller companies, there's some things that really stand out. And... I've had customers who have come to me and said, you know, we're just not big enough for managed services. We're not ready for them. Um, you know, our environment is, is in too much flux. Um, but I wanted to, to really spend some time kind of debunking that. And the first part about it is, is what I like to call a partner platform. So if you are a growing biotech, you have the needs for certain resources with certain skill sets at certain times. By working with a managed service provider, you can tap into that. And whether that be the architect, whether that be uh, an extra set of hands to, to push through a, a, a big manufacturing push, you wanna be able to access those partners as much as possible. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a whole slide on, on the concept of the partner platform next. In addition to accessing the right person, you wanna be able to access the right amount of a person. Again, if I'm talking about an architect, I need an architect early in my process and I need them for a couple of weeks. I may not even need them full time during those couple of weeks, but when I need them, I really need them. So by able to access a partial resource and get an industry expert, someone who has 20 years experience, who understands the concept of best practices, uh, it actually complements the rest of your team. And, and through the managed service partner platform, we can spin people on and off because we're already built to do that. Environmental maturity is one that I hear a lot of when they say, you know, we're not ready for an MSP because our process isn't defined well enough. Well, that's part of the challenge. You know, so there's, there's ways to look at what is being done within the lab and embrace the best practices, embrace the industry standards for you know, how to deploy a system, how to run a system, how to load a column. And those are the things that these services can be bringing to your team. Now, a lot of it is foundational. Right? It's not gonna be the most interesting thing in the world, um, but it does help you build 
a stronger foundation within your laboratory. So I'm going to spend a whole slide on that in, in a few minutes as well. Okay. Cost keeps coming up. So centralized spending on tap in order to tap into opportunities to drive value. Um, that's a nice way to save money. Okay. So it's a scenario where we, we do want to do that. But now, if you are centralizing your spend and you have better control over it, you now know quarter to quarter, month to month, you know, what is coming down the line and what do you need in order to keep your foundation? Okay. And then I, I always close with, you know, core business. So this is the, the first one that we talked about on the last slide for even the big companies. You move to a partner so that you can work and then have more time to think strategically to drive on your own discoveries and to, to focus on the core business. Okay. Partner platform access. When you work with a managed service, one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to establish an MSA. The MSA is the rules of engagement for how the teams will operate, you know, how will vendor and client play together, and how will work be delivered. It's not your SOW. We're not talking about metrics and governance and penalties and all that yet, but we're talking about the overall business behavior between the two groups. In some cases, those MSAs, especially with the big farmers, can take months to finish. With the smaller groups, it's usually easier, but it, but it does establish uh, a legal review. It does require us to, to, to put some effort into it to get it done. But once we have that MSA, we now can work. And when we talk about a partner platform, you know, what we're looking for here now is being able to leverage human expertise. How can I get access to the right resource at the right time? And I, I have here just as, as an example, in terms of many of the companies that we work with, you know, we'll often start small with strategic planning. This could be a roadmap. This could be some workflows that we, we lock down for them in terms of business process automation. But it could also be a full architect. It could be tech selections. It could be um, taking them right through an RFP. Those small projects will then lead to something else, okay? a deployment a customization, a configuration, um, in the sense of the manufacturing space, it can move into compliance, uh, some, some quality work, that sort of thing. But the idea here is that you now can build out exactly what it is that you have. There's no right or wrong path through this. So you could start with the fact that you just deployed a limb system and you need an admin. That admin may only be there 20 hours a week. So you're, you're tapping into the right resource. They're delivering production run support for you. But then when you need to integrate that limbs with your ELN, you can lean on your professional services. You can actually have people who have that integration experience. We can do the requirements. We can do the mapping. We can do the development work. The idea is that you're tapping into the same team and therefore you're going forward and you're building out that partnership. Now, if you think in terms of, a, again, a small biotech, it may be the case where you have multiple people all working a partial amount, but all working towards the same overall goal of establishing a more robust life science informatics environment for them. Um, and, I, and I can give you an example. So I have a, a customer right now. Uh, we do about $400,000 a year with them in terms of managed services. But we have eight people, eight asterisk people, who are onboarded to that biotech. So if you look in terms of pure numbers, we're almost 10% of their total onboards. But none of my eight people are working 40 hours a week. You know, they're all working at an appropriate level to match the needs of that biotech spread across the portfolio. And it runs all the way from architect services uh, right into production run support of their ELN, uh, right into some development work where we're integrating an ELN with uh, an animal um, management software. So there's that element now of working within the group and establishing that connection so that you have the right people with the right expertise at the right level. And yes, in the end, there's, there's the cost factor where you're getting access to eight experts, but you're only spending 400K. Okay. All right. If we step 
towards now maturation of the environment. This is where you want to be, even if you're a small biotech, you want to be building for when you're a big biotech. You want to be building for, you know, not the 20 people that you currently have, but the 100 people that are coming. As you move through your trials, you're going to be onboarding people. You know, how do you actually go through that such that you've built something that is sustainable even as you expand? Okay. And we've all been there. We understand that in early days of a biotech, everybody's wearing multiple hats. Okay. So the scientist is also the IT guy and the IT guy's gotta go meet with the HPLC vendor to get the PM done. Um, the idea is that when you leverage managed services, you can actually build out that process, and then that process acts as a foundation for you. Okay, so what is now the easiest way to execute capital purchases? Okay. In the past, scientists might have called the guy in procurement. He might have told him that he wanted this instrument, and the day that the instrument arrives, the facility guy looks out at his dock and he goes, what's this? And now you know that that instrument needs space, that instrument needs power, that instrument needs a PC. Nobody's communicated. So rather than the scientist who has now done all the legwork to bring it in, he's got to now sit and wait two to four weeks for all the rest of the work to come through. Where if you had a process, the process now brings it in. And when it lands, there's a PC ready to go. There's already a footprint for it in the lab. You have the appropriate utilities that you need. And it's, it's not rocket science, but it is foundational thinking, which makes the entire operation run better. Okay, so, so we're here, we're, we're now we're looking at current process, we're trying to bring in best practice. And then as we start to work across various groups, we're looking for what are the common threads between those groups, such that we can harmonize the process and we can establish standards. Okay? All of this is your own process. It's your own standard. So I, I don't want this to, to sound like it's coming in in a way where you know, we're dropping a, a one, fits, one size fits all model. Uh, these are all tailored to your specific needs. Okay? So it's a, a, an appropriate way to bring something to a stable environment and, and make you ready to grow. My next bit, I'm coming back to the core business objectives. So I've hit on this twice already. It is one of the, the main themes of this presentation. Okay. You're in the research business, you're in the drug discovery business, you know, you're out to find new targets to increase value with your company. And the model that's put forth here um, is, is one that was published by a, uh, a mid-size biotech, um, well, maybe even I'd even say a large biotech at this point where they looked at the different pieces that they had within their space and they, they split it such that it was now an established part of their critical thinking when it came to staffing. What is it that made them special? And what is it where they were gonna be investing in their scientists, in their, their PhDs, such that they would have discovery differences? And those people were your in-house experts, they were your FTEs, okay? and they were the ones that made the competitive difference. But now, what do you need? You need a foundation, you need a lab, you need an IT environment, you need a certain structure there in order for those FTEs to be maximized and optimized, okay? Those are the important foundational, but not core activities. All that went to managed service providers. Okay? Um, in this case, they partnered with multiple, so they had split up even their IT environment such that one group had network infrastructure and the other group had scientific IT. So a good, a good way to, to divide it up, but they leveraged who they felt were the best possible. They also then drew a line in terms of the CROs and they had both established partnerships with commodity CROs and specialties. And, and the specialists were the ones where they were happy to spend more money because it tied very closely to their FTEs and, and the work that they were needed done. And then in terms of the commodity ones, this is more of your cost savings. You know, where could they send material out to have work done, which again, 
needed to be done because it was part of the foundation of the science. But at the same point, it was not going to be the critical high tech discovery that was going to push them along. And so I like this because it, it splits it out in a nice clean way. And how do you build your overall operation to run within the different types of resources that you're going to be able to get your FTEs, your MSPs, as well as your CROs. Okay. So I would hope at this point you have a good understanding in terms of a managed service, sort of the value that they bring, how they're able to come forward, um, and also, you know, what is it that you're going to get for core benefits? So focus on the core business objectives, access that partner. Uh, portal, so that partner plan to give you the resources that you need at the right levels and such. I'm going to spend the next couple, oh, sorry, one more pit before I spend the next couple. Um, so now, generally speaking, in terms of the overall selection of a managed service, um, my, my main piece on this is the managed service provider that you pick will be the right one for you. If you go Accenture, Cognizant, Tata, and they feel like they're the right match, it's going to be the right match for you. If you go Asterix, you like the concept of a company that is focused on life science informatics, that'll be the right fit for you. But there are certain pieces that you'll be able to dig into on whether or not the fit is perfect. And you need a partner. And I, I have that as the last item here on this slide. And there needs to be somebody within that managed service group who is going to be the proverbial one throat to choke. Okay? They are the responsible party. Sometimes they're called a customer success manager. Sometimes they're called a, a, a strategic partner. Um, but they are going to be the ones who are responsible for the day-to-day -day delivery of that work. They will be managing in setting up the governance, they will be establishing the metrics, they will be working step by step with you to make sure that the work is being done in a way which complements your company's needs and culture. And a big part of this is culture. And so when we bring in managed services, you know, we want to make sure that the scientists are getting the value that they want out of them. I mean, certain companies, they want an on-site group. Certain companies are happy with a phone call service. Certain companies are very happy with just an email service. So it's different pieces. You'll know your company as far as what it is that you need. And the bullets above now really just helped you to define. So as you start to go through this and you start thinking in terms of what is it I need, it's really now looking at saying, let's define what is the domain and what are the, um, the different things that we're gonna put into the service? Is it lab computing? Is it project management? Okay. And then what is it that I need within that group? And so, who has access to the different vendors that we're going to be supporting? Who has the ability to leverage consultants and have the consultants be at the ready? And this is a big part of a managed service versus hiring an individual off the street. An army of one off the street could be very successful, but they're only going to be as good as that person is. Where when you're working with a managed service, you now have that ability to reach back into the organization and understand what it is actually ask the question back to that group and get an understanding out of them in terms of not only what is the question that I'm asking, but what are the other ramifications of that question in areas that perhaps I'm not thinking about right now. So it's a case where when you are running lab computing managed services, you're not alone. You know, we run this for, for multiple groups, you know, across the U.S. such that if we have a question in terms of an instrument and an operating system, it's likely one of our team members has seen it before. And so you want to have that availability in order to expand on, on your information as you're getting. And the rest of it is, is very um, tactical. And, um, what time zones? Do they give you the right support? Do you want it local? That sort of thing. So all pieces that, that are important to kind of dig in when you're in your design phase for each of your managed services. We like to follow the ITIL V3 method. Um, it starts with sitting down and talking strategy. What is it that you're looking for in terms of your 
overall deliverable. Okay, so we start with, you know, what do I need to be done? And then you, know, you start to talk about what are the, the pieces that we need to consider as we're going towards that final deliverable. So what is the strategy that we're, we're, we're gonna be bringing forward? Once we understand that, we put in a design. The design will now start to do ticket analysis. It will start to look at the needs of your business. It will start to lay out how we are going to achieve that. How many resources available at what days and what times and at what locations. And then we start to lay out metrics and those metrics will now give us our SLAs and our KPIs, which truly are the measurement of the success of the program. Now, SLAs and KPIs are terrific. You always want to be recording them because if you're not measuring something, you can't improve it. Um, but at the same point, it's only half. You do want to have your customer satisfaction pieces. You know, so there is always that element of determining, is it the right thing for the scientists? Are the scientists using the service? Are they happy with the service? Just because a ticket is closed doesn't mean that the ticket was adequately resolved. So you build all that out in terms of your governance. Once strategy and design is done, we now start to move into transition. The transition is often the first time you're meeting the expanded business unit. Okay? So it's your first impression. So we wanna make sure that the transition is tight. It works in a way where we are informing the business that we're coming. So there's a lot of information, a lot of announcements, perhaps a lunch and learn uh, where we actually have lunch, uh, which is, uh, I know that's historical, but you know, back in the day, we actually did bring pizza to these types of, uh, of seminars. Um, but we start working at all of that. We build into the steady state mode, and then we continue to focus on the, the continuous improvement. The goal of the service is that a year from now, we should be doing more for the same price that we were doing this year. We should be building in our own efficiencies. We should be resolving problems. We should start to be proactive in the sense that we are going to now either do trainings, make amendments, do something which is going to allow us to avoid that ticket in the first place. And so the efficiency should go up year over year over year. All right, I'm gonna spend just the, the last four slides here on what we feel are, are crucial to biotechs and mid-sized pharmas in terms of uh, the MSPs that, that Asterix operates in. Uh, we're gonna touch base on lab computing, scientific app support, uh, the concept of the laboratory ambassador. Um, and then we'll talk about how those three all kind of get tied together. And then we'll wrap up with project management and, and program management as, a, as an offering. Okay. So first bit, lab computing. Yeah. I like to describe this as the lab computing service takes care of every PC that is in the lab. It's, we don't need to talk about whether it's attached to an instrument. We don't need to talk about whether it's there as an ELN portal or a data presentation portal. If it's a PC and it's in the lab, it's part of the service. If it's in the carpeted areas, that's your tier one IT. Okay? If it's out there, they'll take care of that. Major part of this for us is, is now working in inventory, having that inventory, which is a full record of every PC, every operating system that exists in your lab space. Now, we need that for future projects. Okay? So uh, I can tell you, we've, we've kind of been through the ringer on the, the Windows XP to Win 7. Uh, we're now wrapping up the last of our Win 7 to Win 10. Uh, I'm sure there'll be something that comes after that. Uh, but being able to look at your inventory and say, I've got 100 PCs in the environment. I know this many are Win 10. I know this many are Max. I know this many are embedded in the instruments. You know, those are the things that, that we want to pay close attention to. Okay. And then we're going to work to address any issues that come up. Scientists walks up to their machine. It's got a blue screen. We are first to respond. Uh, grab the PC that exists that in storage that's already been um, ITized for your company, and then we're off. We take the image, we swap it out. They're back in business, and we work with IT to harmonize on a standard lab platform. And we work with the business as they're buying PC as they're buying instruments to make sure we have a PC ready. 
So these are all steps that we're taking to make the, the IT environment in the labs more robust. Okay. And I'm, I'm happy to go into a lot more details um, you know, with a, a future conversation, but I just wanted to kind of put these out so you get a sense of what are the different flavors of, of scientific IT managed services that, that are out there. So lab computing is a big one. Scientific application support um, is another big, the, the, the true level one help desks, um, they, they don't have the experience working with the scientific software. Um, and this can be the enterprise stuff, you know, the ELNs, the LIMs, the CDSs, um, but it also can be a lot of the instrument drivers and analysis software. So, you know, we, we do a, a lot uh, in terms of trying to help manage and power CDSs. Um, and power has become the, the dominant system, the dominant solution in the lab. Um, it's not just for Waters HPLCs anymore, um, but there is that need now to have that local Empower admin be there as a first call. Um, Waters is expensive. They don't want necessarily the, the uh, break fix business. You know? So it's a case where we do a lot of just empower administration uh, for groups. And, um, but the other ones too, LIMS, ELNs, and these can be built up as you know a single run support, so production run support for a LabVantage LIMS, where we're we're truly just answering LabVantage LIMS issues all day. We we learn that not only that product, we know the product already, but we learn that deployment. What are the things that have been configured? What are the special integrations that have been built? What are the different functionality that's been released? And then we're taking all of that and establishing the traditional run book. So this is the methodology upon which you know, we're going to go forth and support the entire program. That run book stays with you if, if we decide to part ways in, uh, in the future. Um, but it is that case that that is now your, your secrets book. You have all of the, uh, the answers to the test when the run book is fully built out. Okay. So Scientific application support, it can be as big or as small as you want. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the single limbs, we've also run systems where we, we have the entire portfolio, 120 different applications, um, and we're managing everything from the, the issue mitigation right down to license renewals and that for them. Okay. Um, in terms of the third piece, the laboratory ambassador, um, for us here, Laboratory Ambassador has been, it has been born out of our first lab computing and PSYAPs solutions. So, scenario exists, scientist walks up to the PC, um, they go to start firing up their instrument, it's not working. Is it a PC problem? Is it a network problem? Is it an application problem? Is it an instrument problem? by having the lab ambassador role, we don't care because we're the first team to call. We're the ones that are gonna be out there and now starting to work with the, the OEM, with the vendors, doing the initial troubleshooting and making sure that we have an understanding of what's going on with that asset. We have the IT experience by being the lab computing solution as well. So we can swap out the PC if we need to, we can call on the software, we can actually call on the, the vendors for repair. This is a case where we actually don't turn the wrench. Um, and that, that's an important piece that I want to differentiate here. Uh, your true asset management program. You know, so if you went with a one source or, or across labs, you know, they're going to be the guys that show up and turn the wrench. In terms of the lab ambassador, this is now the facilitation of the instrument care and feeding. So PMs, qualifications, you know, calibrations, all of those things that need to be done uh, on an annual basis, you know, they're part of your contract. Your scientists really don't pay attention to it. They just want to do their research, but you're the one there that now keeps the lab running like a finely tuned machine. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, it goes really well with your lab computing and your, your PSYOP support. Okay. Um, the last Type of managed service that I want to I want to hit on is around project management, and and this is a case where having a strong approach to project management, so having a strong methodology as far as how you're going to be running life science IT projects, 
goes a long way in terms of making sure that your projects stay on track, stay on time, stay on budget, all of that. We can run these as what we call supportive governance or directive. Um, supportive it is a case now where we're providing a, a life science IT PM and they, they truly are just the, uh, the registry. You know, they're recording what's going on. They're reporting what's happening. They're, they're not truly leading programs. More junior role, but at the same point, it fills that gap when you may have a scientist who is going to be your, your team leader. We can have a governance PMO. So this is now where we come in and we start to establish how all of your programs should be managed. What are the infrastructure that you need in place in order to be starting to record those metrics? The directive PM, this is now taking leadership. Okay, so these are more senior PMs. They're going to be out there driving the obligations on both the vendor side and the business side. And they're gonna be working to make sure that the project comes in as expected. And then the complete PMO PM, that's kind of wrapping up all of them. You know, so it's a case where you are responsible for the, the PMO, you're establishing the governance, but you're also providing the project managers. Um, this is a case where you know, we get a lot of value by leveraging our offshore facility in Costa Rica. We have learned through COVID, uh, and in fact, our customers have learned through COVID that an enormous amount of project management work does not have to be on site. You can be working remotely, you can be dialing into your team meetings, and you can still be very successful at, at delivering this um, while working in a cheaper region. So it's a case to, to, to truly move on to that. All right, um, I'm going to wrap this up here um, with just a sort of a summary slide, and I'll, I'll leave this up for, for people to, to read as they have any questions. Um, but the concept is really when you're looking towards a managed service, you, know, you need to think in terms of what are your needs, what are the different pieces that you want to plan for not only today but tomorrow, and then partner. And then that partner becomes the team that you're going to leverage such that you're getting the right resource at the right level, you know, for the right amount of time. And kind of build it out from there. So um, I hope this was helpful. I hope uh, I was able to entertain. Uh, and, and Kevin, that's that's the end of my story.